You're listening to The Back 40, the podcast for Ontario farmers, covering topics and issues that matter most to Ontario agriculture. Brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm the host of The Back 40, Mike Bryan, agribusiness specialist at Trillium Mutual Insurance. Many of us in the agricultural community are familiar with the research stations that we see both in Ontario and across Canada. And much of the research that goes on there is critical to the health of the agricultural industry in Canada. Today, we're going to be talking with Travis Banks. Travis is the Director of Plant Variety Development at Vineland Research and Innovation Centre. Travis, welcome to the Back 40. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. It should be a good conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. So let's just dive right in here. What sort of research does take place at Vineland? Okay, so Vineland's a a not-for-profit port research station. The research we do is broken up into four programs. So the first would be uh, automation, and their focus is on filling technology, knowledge, and resource gaps to identify labor-saving opportunities. Consumer sensory and market insights. So this is a group that helps uh, better understand consumer liking drivers. And we have a, a group that works on biological crop protection. And so their focus is on trying to accelerate the introduction and use of biological and, and plant protection strategies with plant responses in the environment. What they're trying to do is to enhance the evidence of port products as natural solutions to, to problems to create efficiencies in production systems. And then the final group is, is my program. And so that's uh, plant variety development. And so in my group, we have a big focus on developing uh, new plant varieties that are better adapted and therefore more performant for the Canadian climate and the Canadian consumer. I'm sure a lot of people thought, as I did, that this is a government-owned, government-run, but Vineland differs from some of the others. Can you just tell us a little bit what's different about the structure for uh, Vineland? Yeah, sure. So, as I said earlier, Vineland is a is a not-for-profit port research station. Our reason for being is to help and enhance the sustainability of the port sector. And we are run by a board of directors and an innovation sort of panel who help the board make sure that we're doing the right kind of science. We're not like a university, right? A a university primary goal is to train the next generation of of researchers and scientists. We conduct research like a university does. Our focus is more on the innovation part, and that is taking new technologies, new ideas, and sort of extracting value uh, from them or using them to create new value. So we've got a a board of directors who helps uh, guide our CEO on the direction that we need to take. But the types of problems that we work or the types of research that we do at Vineland, they are all sector driven. So all of the research that we do at Vineland is driven by the needs of the horticultural sector in Canada. As researchers, we don't chase down things that are necessarily primarily for us, but we're here to solve the problems of, of other people portion of the port sector comes to us and says, you know, we, we're having a problem with this pest or we're having a problem with uh, you know, this production system. Um, can you help create the science to help us understand what's going on and provide us a solution? On the surface, it may seem like a slightly different thing, but it's significantly different from research. How did you end up with a structure like this? Why does Vineland exist in this particular form? We sit on this beautiful over 200 acre campus in the Niagara region. And so it's been here for about 100 years and various entities on it uh, over the last uh, century. Early 2000s, research investment in this area had sort of declined. A decision needed to be made whether the government wanted to continue making an investment in horticulture or whether they should move on from it. And of course, the horticultural sector is an extremely important sector. And so government said, yes, we want to continue making uh, an investment in horticulture, but let's do things a little bit different. And so this is where the, the idea of Vineland came up. It's the board of directors that makes sure that we're, we're moving in the right direction and that we are addressing the needs of the horticultural sector. So I'm sure there's some people out there saying, okay, so 
we fund this in Canada, but why is it important that we do the research here in this country? Well, couldn't we just bring in some of the research that's being done in other areas that may have a larger hort uh, sector or maybe more aggressive on that? Well, why is it important that we do it here? I'll speak to this question from my program's perspective, and that's plant variety development. A, a great example of this is what we see in the greenhouse sector. The majority of vegetable crops that are grown primarily in southern Ontario. That's the largest area of greenhouse production in Canada. Most of those varieties, those genetics, come from over in Europe, primarily uh, the Netherlands. And so if you see how tomato, for example, performs in Leamington, southern Ontario, versus uh, the Netherlands, there's a yield differential. The tomatoes just perform, that variety of tomato just performs better uh, in the Netherlands. And that's not because of the technology of the greenhouse, and it's certainly not because of the producers. It all comes down to the genetics that aren't necessarily well adapted to the Canadian climate in a controlled environment like a greenhouse. There are differences depending on where that greenhouse is built. In southern Ontario, we get a lot more sunlight than we do in the Netherlands. That heat stress on the plant sort of translates into reduced yield. And so because those plants weren't selected and bred under the environment in which they're produced, there could be adaptation issues. Also, there's disease pressures that are present in Canada that aren't necessarily present in other parts of the world where some varieties we grow are developed. What are the, the different types of plants that you're actually focused on right now for developing new varieties? Right now at Vineland, we have breeding programs in greenhouse tomatoes, in apples, landscape roses, we also are moving to commercialize a bunch of material that came out of our sweet potato breeding program as well. Talk a little bit about that uh, sweet potato breeding program. What specific to the Canadian climate to, and specifically the Ontario climate, what was different enough that they needed a solution that was made in Canada? Yeah, sure. So a number of years ago, we noticed the huge uptake of sweet potatoes by Canadian consumers. We took a look at where those sweet potatoes were coming from. A good number of them were coming from the United States. And so then we looked at trying to understand, well, how come we don't grow more sweet potatoes here in Canada? But what we found is that the varieties that Canadian producers were growing, or some of them still are growing, um, were all developed in the southern United States. So uh, Louisiana State University, University of North Carolina. And so when you, those varieties of sweet potato here, it's a different climate. They didn't necessarily respond as well to a cooler spring. Uh, the time to maturity, because we don't have as many sort of long, hot days as they do in the southern United States. Uh, you know, for example, sweet potatoes, a lot of people have them for Canadian Thanksgiving. So that happens at the beginning of October. And the majority of sweet potatoes that Canadians put on their tables at Thanksgiving come from the United States. And that was because the varieties of potatoes that the uh, farmers were producing didn't mature until um, after our Thanksgiving. So what Wineland ended up doing is we, we formed a, a collaboration with the university in the United States. They essentially handed off a large bag of seed to us and said, okay, start evaluating this material under your conditions and, and let's see what, what you can find. And so what we found was a sweet potato called Radiance. And so Radiance is a, uh, a sweet potato variety that is more uh, frost tolerant than what was previously grown. Um, it's about three weeks earlier. So it's harvested about three weeks, weeks earlier than, than other varieties. And it out yields other varieties by about 20%. It's, it's absolutely stunning. And so what you end up with, you have a sweet potato now that is more resilient to our Canadian springs and early summers, a product that can now get to Canadian dinner tables by Thanksgiving. And it's more profitable for growers because they're able to generate 20% more product in the same amount of, of field space. So it's an absolute win. And I think really speaks to why adaptation for the Canadian environment is so important. 
I don't think that anyone should find that to be too much of a surprise. If you go back far enough, I do remember when we did not grow grain corn in my area because it simply we simply didn't have the varieties. They were developed in the southern states or for further south in Ontario. And I remember the initial crop that my dad grew, which would have been back in uh, 1969, and it yielded in around 80 bushel per acre. And we all know that you know that would be considered today to be a, a, a significant crop failure. People are looking closer to that too. 200 bushel mark. So when you take that back to the horticultural group, it's a smaller industry from the idea of fewer producers and corn is by far and away. Corn and soybeans are the two largest crops grown in Ontario by acreage. So it, it shouldn't be too surprising that we need to adapt some of the varieties to better fit our climate. Yeah. And as you said, one of the challenges we have in horticultural research is there's lots of producers in the horticultural sector but there's a lot of different crops uh, that mm -hmm. fall under that umbrella. And so, you know, getting that critical mass of research uh, investment and research interest that justifies moving forward with variety development uh, sometimes can be difficult. Yes, it is from a perspective of there's a, a thriving horticultural industry. But as you say, sometimes some of the things that they're producing, there's very, very few people that actually produce that particular crop. And certainly that becomes, as you say, more of a challenge there. Now, when I was back in school, we were taught that developing a variety takes a little bit of time. Take us through a little bit of the process here and how long it actually takes in order to get a crop from an idea out to the point where we're actually growing it commercially. Yeah, so that does depend on uh, the type of crop that you are trying to breed or, or develop something for. So in, in something like greenhouse tomatoes, you're looking on the order of, of seven years, and that's about what we were for, for sweet potato as well. So that often starts, if, if you're starting from scratch for a breeding program, you bring in a bunch of different germplasm from gene banks around the world, or maybe there's universities that have some programs that, that have material that can be of interest. And you evaluate that starting material to see what works. Again, depending on the type of crop, something like tomato, then you sort of identify the material that has the best potential. And then you make some, some crosses, you shuffle the genetics, and then you go through many years of selection. It's like a funnel. You start with many, many potentials at the beginning, and every year you focus on material that has the most promise. And uh, at the end, you... Uh, hopefully engage with some some producers who are interested in trialing your material. And then you, you then have to go through the process of commercialization. So at Vineland, we are a research institute. And so uh, our commercialization activities primarily happen through a collaboration with companies. And then you know, if we look at something like apples, well, apples are a bit of a different beast because it's trees. At Vineland, we've been breeding apples for about uh, 10 years. We started a, an apple breeding program in collaboration with the Ontario apple growers. If everything goes as well as it's looking to go right now, by 2028, we should have trees to our first orchards. So fingers crossed. That's an interesting concept there. I'm not that patient by nature here. And I my hat's off to anybody who has the patience to enter into something like a breeding program for apples, because it's not like corn where you grow a new crop every year. And sometimes you just take it to South America and you can get two crops in one year. You're talking a little bit of length of time here before you ever find out what you're going to get from that particular cross. Well, that's right. And so the breeding takes a long time. Mm -hmm. um, then when you get that new variety to a grower, you know, it, it's an investment and there's, there's risk associated with it because they may not pull their first crop off of what they plant for four or five years, perhaps. And so, you know, you want to make sure that they've got an apple that's going to perform when it finally does start producing fruit for them. I would think that would be a challenge just to get people to try some of the new varieties on an apple basis, specifically because, you know, you invest those four or five years in the trees you really want to be sure when you get done that when you take those apples off the tree that somebody is interested in buying them, that, that somebody likes that. How do you evaluate that and how do you set somebody's mind at ease if they're going to invest all that money in those apples that they're actually going to be able to sell them when they, get to, when they come off the trees? Is your organization in need of funding for a capital project? 
Australia Mutual's Roots Community Fund provides funding towards projects such as renovations, expansions, and equipment purchases that support rural Ontario. Roots helps ensure that these organizations will remain a crucial part of the local community. To learn more about Roots, including how to apply, visit our website at trilliummutual.com and click Community at the top of the page. In all of our breeding programs, actually, at, at, at Blind Land, very, very early on, we involve um, the Consumer Sensory Market Insights Group. We, we want to understand what are, the, what are the characteristics that are driving consumers to like a product. We have a sensory panel here at Blind Land. So just as there are people who can have a glass of wine and describe to you all the different characteristics uh, that they experience when they have a sip of that wine, we have a consumer or we have a sensory panel here at Vineland that can do the same thing for lots of different uh, horticultural products, including apples. So we, we brought them all of these apples. They developed a vocabulary that describes all of the different sensations that they have when they taste an apple. You know, for me, when I taste an apple, I, I can just tell you whether I like it or not. I don't have a sophisticated palate, but these, but these people certainly do. And so once we understood what are the different characteristics of flavor and texture and aroma, we then took those same apples to consumers in Toronto. And so a consumer is like, I'm an apple consumer. It's just, do I like this apple more? Do I like apple A more than I like apple B? And so then our consumer insights group is able to bring together those two pieces of information and develop a predictive model. So based on the different characteristics, the sensory characteristics, we can now make a prediction on whether the apple is going to be preferred by consumers. After a time, when we think we found something that apples that look promising, uh, we'll then take them for sensory evaluation. And so this is a way we have been driving our, um, our Apple program. And uh, last year, we, we sort of got confirmation that, that we are absolutely on the right track. So this is after nine years of development. Uh, we took them to consumers in Toronto. And, um, you know, of the varieties that consumers tasted, um, every one of Vineland's varieties was preferred more than Gala. And Gala is sort of like the workhorse of the, of the Apple world in Canada. Almost every one of our apples was like as much or more than Honeycrisp. And, and Honeycrisp is regarded by many as you know, one of the most preferred apples uh, on the Canadian market right now. And so this whole strategy of you know, understanding what the consumers want when you're starting the breeding process is really important. We did the same thing. Uh, we're doing the same thing in, in greenhouse tomatoes. So about 10 years ago, we started a greenhouse tomato breeding program in collaboration with the Ontario Greenhouse Vegetable Growers. And at that time, they said, we would like to see tomato on the vine type tomatoes specifically that are better adapted to the Canadian climate uh, than what we're currently growing. And we want to make sure that they taste great and are preferred by consumers. And so we did that same strategy. We identified a good, good starting material you know, we see the same sorts of results that the, the TOVs coming out of our breeding program are preferred as much or more uh, often than what is currently grown. Uh, we even, oh, go on, please. Yeah, it's, it's amazing when you start talking about consumer preferences. And I, and I know that a few years ago when I was uh, with Agricor, we had a gentleman come in who was a greenhouse operator. And he talked about the tomatoes that we used to get in the store in the wintertime, which were pink and hard. If you dropped them, they either would bounce or break. They didn't have a lot of flavor. They didn't have a lot of color. The texture was awful. Everybody remembers that. But if you tried to grow that now, nobody would buy it. Consumers have gotten used to the idea that when they buy a tomato, they want it to taste like a tomato and preferably the closer to a field tomato that they get in the middle of summer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that's what consumers are demanding. And so that's what and, and it trickles down, right? Retailers know what, what people are, are looking for. And the retailers communicate that to the markers, marketers and the marketers communicate that to the growers. But horticultural producers, they tend to be really innovative folks. And so they're not opposed to taking calculated risks. I, I can believe that. If you go back much younger, me, and we were out for an afternoon drive and my mom decided that uh, we needed a bushel of apples and we stopped an orchard 
and drove in and there was an older gentleman there that didn't speak a word of English. I think he was Italian, but he did not speak any English at all. And we're trying to tell him what we wanted. And he walked back to the his storage and he came out with three apples and he handed one to each of us. And all he said was, Matsu. And that was the first time I ever tasted a, a Matsu apple. And we we brought a bushel home with us. There is something about that at that time, a new variety to find a way to get consumers to accept that because if they just try it, they'll find that it, it is at least as, as you say, at least as good as anything that's out there on the market. Uh, and if you're aiming for something that's better than Honeycrisp, I mean, that's a high standard right there. Obviously, you need you need a product that consumers are going to buy. But you need a product that a consumer or that a, a producer can grow profitably. So there are a number of really great tasting apples that do well at you pick orchards. You know, maybe they just don't store very well, right? So you can't put them in cold storage and, and bring them out to your retailer months later. Or maybe they, they don't do well in the pack line. So, you know, when you harvest an apple, it's got to go through cleaning and, and sizing and, and, and packing. So if it doesn't, the apple doesn't have those characteristics to uh, perform well in the production environment, then it's never going to see the light of day uh, at a grocery store. They obviously want, you know, high quality, consistent product for, you know, as many months of the year as possible. So all of those things have to be taken into consideration when you're developing, you know, whether it's uh, an apple or, or tomato or, or really any other uh, type of produce. I think that a lot of people lose sight of that sometimes that those apples that look so good in the store, if they go down the line and they, they end up, they're all bruised by the time they get through the processing line there, and nobody's going to want to buy them at that point. We've become very used to having very good quality apples come out in the winter time and later than that even. Uh, and those are all developments that have happened over the last 30 years or so. Uh, we have a lot of new varieties now that do much better in those circumstances. Yeah, and so one of the goals of our program is so is for us to develop varieties that are even better than what's currently out there, but they're adapted to the Canadian environment. So if you look at something like, uh, you know, Honeycrisp, it's a really delicious apple, but it's um, it can be tricky to grow. Again, it's not adapted to, to our region. Often it's biannual bearing, so it really only creates fruit every other year. It's got disease issues, but it makes a great product. So if you could put something in the hands of producers that does as well or better yet, maybe it performs well every year, that they don't have a lot of crop loss because of disease, that they don't have to do as much orchard maintenance and, and management, you know, that stores longer, you know, all things that you have to keep an eye on. And it's really challenging. So if you were to come to Vinelands campus and walk out into the field with me, you'd see about 23,000 individual apple selections. So they're all genetically unique. And so from that 23,000, our apple breeder and our team helps us focus down on, on what works. We've got a whole molecular biology lab too uh, that helps us speed up the breeding process and help ensure that we are moving in the right direction. Now that uh, lab that you talked about that uh, you're using there to speed up, you're not talking here about changing the genetic material there. You're talking about evaluating the genetic material as you go. Yeah, that's right. So I'll, uh, I'll use roses as an example. So Canadian roses are known uh, around the world for their exceptional cold hardiness. And um, about 12 years ago, A Canada had a rose breeding program in Morden, Manitoba. But in addition to cold hardiness, we wanted to create roses that are black spot resistant. So what we did is we developed something called a, a genetic marker. And so a genetic marker is just a laboratory test that can tell you about a characteristic that a plant will have. And so we found a gene. If a rose has this gene, it's going to be resistant to black spot. And so what we do with our molecular lab, you know, every season we'll germinate a whole bunch of seed We'll start growing them up in the greenhouse, and we'll then we'll take just a leaf off of every one of those plants, and we'll take it to our molecular biology lab. And it simply that just tells us the seedling that this leaf came from is going to be black spot resistant or is not going to be black spot resistant. We're not changing the genes of the plant. We are simply reading what it already says. And so in our breeding program, we want to make sure that our plants have these resistances. 
some really great research that we've been doing. Uh, a lot of it is in, you know, based on our biochemical work is not only are we selecting for traits like disease resistance, but now we're starting also to select for consumer traits. So we try to incorporate these types of technologies where we can, uh, because it, it can help save, it can help save a bunch of time if it helps focus our resources. So we're breeding more efficiently. That's also a good thing. So from the standpoint of use these biomarkers, you should come up with more viable varieties and you should also do it less period of time as well, if I'm understanding you correctly on that. So what is coming down the pipe then? What can we expect to see out of Vineland uh, as some of the, the research and some of the innovations we're going to see over the next few years? Oh boy. Um, so from plant variety development, I'll start with roses. So we've got a collection of roses called the uh, 49th Parallel. And so these are all roses that are bred to be very cold hardy and black spot resistant. Um, so if you go to 49throses.com, you can see the selections that we have this spring coming up, 2023. We'll be re uh, releasing a really, really beautiful rose called um, Yukon Sun. Radiant sweet potato is already in the market. Uh, next year, we'll be uh, launching a yellow flesh sweet potato called Luminance. Um, Apples, we're still, like I said, we're still a few years away, but we're, we're pretty confident in what we're doing. And uh, in our tomato program, we've developed uh, and released uh, a few hybrid tomato varieties that uh, do really well here in, in Canadian greenhouses. But our focus uh, in the near term for tomato will be introducing uh, resistance to a new disease that's popped up. What about from a technology standpoint? Anything that we can see coming down the road from that, that perspective? Yeah, so coming up, uh, you know, in, in tomatoes, I said there's a, a new virus that has, has popped up. And so, you know, it, it happens time to time. This one has spread very quickly across the world. And the impact of it is that if your crop uh, gets it, uh, it makes your fruit develop sort of uh, wrinkled brown or yellow blotches. And so really hurts the marketability of the fruit. And it's really contagious. And it's, it's difficult to get out of your greenhouse. And so it arrived in Canada in 2019. The Ontario government made an investment in Vineland's breeding program to help us identify a source of rugose resistance. So once we identify that rugose resistance, we could then breed that into the um, Canadian adapted tomatoes that we had already developed. Uh, that is something that we're working on right now. Within a few years, we should have seeds to growers, uh, greenhouse producers that they can be trialing to see how they perform for them. And so what I what I really like about the, the Rugo story is it captures the strength of an organization uh, like Vineland. As far as I know, we are the only organization in all of North America that is breeding uh, greenhouse tomatoes. The way that we are structured, which is um, to be nimble and to respond quickly to industry needs, you know, we were able to do that. A new disease came on board. And uh, we we're able to to start research to address it. It's really exciting to be a part of that, and to know that at the end of it, you're going to be creating a product that is going to make a real difference uh, to people. You never want to hear that about the new disease that's moving in and the the difficulties with it. But we all know that that's a reality to industries, whether you're talking plant varieties or, or livestock, that that's going to happen every so often. And and the idea that you're able to respond quickly to that to be able to hopefully come up with a solution for growers is, is certainly going to help the Canadian market down the road. That's for sure. So this, this obviously is a lifelong passion for you. How did you end up in the plant breeding sector and, and how did you end up out at Vineland looking after all of the research that's going on there for variety development? Yeah, I think, you know, like a lot of people, if you told me 20 years where I was going to end up, I wouldn't have believed it. So I started off studying biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of Saskatchewan at the time. I ended up getting a, a student position at the Plant Biotechnology Research Center, the NRC, uh, located in Saskatoon. And I found that I really enjoyed it. And so I ended up going to grad school with a focus on molecular biology. It was right around the time where... Um, DNA sequencing technology was really taking off and this whole new area of research was starting to open up. And so I decided that I would move my career from molecular biology to something called bioinformatics. And so that's kind of using computer science to help understand what's going on uh, on the biological level. 
And I ended up working when I was done school, I ended up going to uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Winnipeg at the Cereal Research Station. And then I guess about 13 years ago, an opportunity opened up here at Vineland. So I left Chile, Winnipeg and came down to lovely Niagara. And I've been here ever since. And so here, the work I do has always been very, very tightly integrated with plant breeding and genomics and genetics, you know, moved my way from research scientists to the director level. Well, be it uh, roses or sweet potatoes, tomatoes or apples, we'll look forward to some of those new varieties finding their way out into the Canadian marketplace. Travis, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak to us today on the Back 40. No, it's been my pleasure. You know, anything I can do to, to let people know about what's going on at Vineland, I happily do. Thank you very much. We've been speaking with Travis Banks, Director of Plant Variety Development at Vineland Research and Innovation Centre. With the availability of processed foods and the food service industry with so many restaurants out there, it seems sometimes that kids don't get exposed to cooking for themselves at home. That problem has been compounded by the fact that many of our family studies courses have been taken out of our schools. Well, there's an organization in London that is trying to change all that. Growing Chefs is trying to reintroduce the joys of cooking to school-age kids. Join us next time as we talk to the founder of Growing Chefs, Andrew Fleet. That's next time on The Back 40. You've been listening to The Back 40, Brought to you by Trillium Mutual Insurance. Be sure to subscribe to The Back 40 wherever you find your favorite podcasts so that you don't miss an episode. The Back 40, bringing the ag community together one podcast at a time. I'm Mike Brine. Until next time, take care and stay safe.